to be surpassed. It happens to most of us with time. A new star rises and replaces the old. But just because one star burns brighter doesn't mean that the old still doesn't have some life within it. Or some light to shed. The former king was not killed when he was replaced, but now has become the Duke of Combat instead. While the most noteworthy machines of humanity's distant future amongst the stars appears to be the lords of the battlefield, battle mechs, there was a star that predated them, and truth be told, may still be a contender for their crown. Whether it rolls on wheels or treads, whether it hovers or flies. There are more vehicles on the field of warfare than the giant, lumbering titans which seem to dominate it, and to dominate the images around it. In this video, I will be covering the former kings of war, the half-forgotten titans, which have been a major component of all war since the late industrial age. Armored, Vehicles. Before the Industrial Age, mankind had already warred for thousands of years in ways we would understand today. In this, eventually one would see advancements over time adding new pieces to the battlefield. The horse would be a major element of this, first appearing in the form of chariots to the Bronze Age battlefields of the Eastern Mediterranean kingdoms, and then in the form of mounted warriors riding on horseback. Over time, this would develop further, with new technologies making the horses better platforms to attack from, resulting in various types of horse cavalry. The final evolution of mounted cavalry would appear in the 20th century, during the Two Great Wars. But on these battlefields, these various traditional mobile troops would be challenged by an emerging technology. Automobiles of various types, as well as industrial vehicles, were already part of many societies around the world before the Great Wars. The first major appearance of a truly groundbreaking new technology was the invention of what was dubbed, to keep it secret at first, the tank. But these weren't the first true fighting automated vehicles. Armored cars and armored trains both made their debut beforehand. Aircraft, despite not being armored, were already beginning to appear in the battle space. A new era of war had started and one which was inevitably to be dominated by these mechanical beasts. All of these machines would, over the course of the 20th century, evolve into the rough framework of what armored vehicles would appear as in the future eras of warfare, even among the stars in Battletech. Tanks throughout the Second World War would evolve into light, medium, and heavy tanks broadly, but after the war they would take on the form of the MBT or main battle tanks. Other major combat vehicles that appeared during the Great War also had life in this new world. Self-propelled guns or mobile artillery are some of the most prominent. Another example would be mobile anti-air defenses, and of course, armored personnel carriers. The latter of these would begin to take shape over the 20th century, evolving yet further into infantry fighting vehicles. Aircraft would begin to change with this as well, but they fell into the category mostly of aerospace fighters in their development path. All the same, another branch of aircraft would eventually come to appear, known as helicopters, which would begin to take on a variety of roles. These variations of vehicles would appear in support of armies, and in many ways were the central focus of those armies throughout most of the Terran conflicts of the 20th century on Earth, as well as the 21st century of Battletech more specifically, all while working with the irreplaceable infantrymen as well. These would continue to evolve in terms of their armored protection, firepower, and other technologies, 
But the set frame for mankind's military weaponry seems set, and was set, leading into the era known as the Age of War. Humanity would begin to reach out across the stars after the introduction of faster-than-light travel at the beginning of the 22nd century. Colonization would begin to follow shortly after. This would be done and overseen by the unified Terran authority known as the Terran Alliance. War would find its place among the stars, especially as the Terran Alliance's influence began to decline. Vehicles would be the kings of these battlefields, much like they were on Terra before. Tanks would roll through these alien worlds, firing on targets, either in defense or in the attack. Slowly, with time, individual worlds or loose political associations started to become more powerful, evolving from small worlds into larger blocks, which then evolved into stronger, centralized states devouring their allies or enemies until huge star-spanning empires began to form across the inner sphere. These now engorged states would begin to fight one another. This is appropriately named the Age of War. This long era, which even saw the collapse of the Terran Alliance and the rise of the Terran hegemony, would begin to see the introduction of a new technology which would finally reduce the importance of what had been the main fighting vehicles of the Inner Sphere. Prior to the arrival of the Battle Mech, dropships meant for combat were exclusively vehicle and infantry centric in their design. The entirety of all military infrastructure was built around the supporting of what were in essence modern combat vehicles. Wars would rage between all of these growing powers using their traditional armies until the arrival of the walking war machines which would come to dominate the world of Battletech. Jacob Cameron, the Director General of the Terran Hegemony, the successor to the Terran Alliance, would change history by promoting the construction of the first battle mech, the Mackey, as well as mass producing it. For the first time in humanity's history, in the 25th century, Traditional, armored tanks and other vehicles were challenged by something completely new when these bizarre machines were unleashed on the other nations of the Inner Sphere. Forces from the relatively young Federated Sons, Draconis Combine, Free Worlds League, Capellan Confederation and Lyran Commonwealth were utterly crushed by these hulking machines, much to the shock and surprise of commanders and leaders abroad. So brutal were these defeats and so feared were these machines that the other houses would strive to resolve this problem by any means. The Lyran Commonwealth would be the first to acquire battle mech technology through theft, and eventually all other houses would have these plans to hand. An arms race would begin, but it would finally be one that left traditional vehicles behind. Houses cared more for these new war machines than other military assets as of their introduction. And perhaps only warships took a higher priority at times throughout human space and history. But despite being so central to the best forces in human space, they were only a component of war. Tanks, infantry fighting vehicles, VTOLs, the successors to helicopters more or less, and an assortment of other war machines were still in production, using a variety of technologies and weapons in order to still be a presence on the battlefield. In every era which followed, these forces would still be present, either in support or in defiance of battle mechs. Their roles would change though, instead of being the premier machines of their age, they had regressed into the role of support or into the conditions of being lower cost alternatives, becoming a favorite amongst planetary militias. Easier to build than battle mechs, tanks and other fighting vehicles will never disappear from the scene, but their importance waxes and wanes depending on the conditions of humanity. In the following portion of this video, I will be talking about some of the rules regarding these vehicles as well as their lore, but I will not be going over them in intricate detail. 
If you wish for a full understanding of them, I'd recommend checking out Battletech Total Warfare, the rulebook. The most familiar site in the setting to all those who have followed conflicts in the 20th century would not be the walking giants that the setting is known for, but rather would be the treaded forms of armored fighting vehicles. These machines act as they always have, for the most part, within the context of the universe and the in-game rules. Even then, however, there are advanced technologies in the setting, particularly in the forms of their mode of transit, that might make these a bit of an oddity in some cases to look at, particularly regarding hover tanks. Tanks and other ground-based fighting vehicles have some important distinctions from battle mechs in-game. While they are armed with similar weapons, and even similar weight classes, their ground movement is slightly different, as well as the way which they receive damage from incoming fire. It's important to note that due to AFVs having a lower profile, they can more easily be concealed by hills or other terrain types, giving them some advantages as ambush vehicles. To start with, examining how protection works on these assets, armored fighting vehicles receive damage in a more limited number of sides than a mech, as they don't have limbs, which means they have a section for front armor, side armor, rear armor, and then a turret where applicable. These places will proportionately have more exterior armor than their mech counterparts. But these surfaces are also more likely to be hit by enemy attacks. This just means that when an attack comes from a certain angle, there's no real choice to hit an arm. You're either going to hit the facing you're against or the turret, almost entirely, meaning these locations may be diminished more quickly than might happen to a battle mech. AFVs are also more likely to suffer through armor criticals, and their critical hit chart is more likely to lead to the destruction of the vehicle on average. The critical table itself for ground combat vehicles is particularly brutal, with some results being crippling or just outright destroying the vehicle in a single blow. There is also a separate motive system damage table as well, which can impact vehicles when they fail piloting skill rules for a ground vehicle, and can even result in the permanent immobilization of that vehicle on the battlefield. In other words, vehicles tend to lack some of the durability of their mech counterparts even within the same weight brackets, despite potentially having similar armor and weapons. When moving into the realms of movement, there are first a few things that have to be talked about regarding vehicles, which isn't just their mode of movement, whether they are wheeled, treaded, or hovering, but also the means of providing propulsion to the vehicle, i.e. its onboard power plant. Battle mechs almost exclusively utilize the form of fusion power plants, for instance. This energy propels the mech, provides it with power for any energy weapons on board, and makes sure that mechs can fight and keep on going under a multitude of situations. Vehicles such as tanks and other armored fighting vehicles do have these kinds of engines as well, but not consistently or exclusively. In fact, they very routinely have an engine type which is listed as an ICE, which stands for an internal combustion engine, the very same kinds of engines you'll find in modern vehicles here on Earth today, or in huge, powerful engines which run in our tanks here today. The reason why ICE engines are common in vehicles of multiple types is frankly that they are much more widely available, and are significantly cheaper to manufacture. In fact, worlds which cannot produce sophisticated battle mechs, aerospace fighters, or cutting-edge ground vehicles, often are able to manufacture and produce powerful war assets which run on ICE engines and are armed with heavy weaponry and armor as a result, making these kinds of vehicles a very common sight to see across the war zones of the inner sphere. When it comes to ground movement, they move much like a mech on the tabletop for the most part, going over terrain with the same penalties and such. Though tracked and wheeled vehicles can further face complications should they end up skidding, and skidding or other piloting skill rolls might just lead to a motive damage system roll, which is far from ideal. 
For all of these drawbacks, one might assume that armored fighting vehicles have extremely limited use as compared to mechs. But this couldn't be further from the truth. In reality, vehicles can often outpace and outfight their walking counterparts on the ground in a multitude of ways. To start with, they are significantly lower in production cost, as mentioned prior. But this is also reflective of not only their sea bill cost, but their on-field battle value cost. A great example for this would be the Ruthless Saladin, a hover tank outfitted with an AC-20 autocannon and gliding across the field at an outrageous 129 kilometers per hour. While independently, yes, this vehicle might be vulnerable to incoming fire, or might suffer drawbacks, it is only 600 battle value, or 911,000 sea bills in terms of its in-universe cost. A Timberwolf, without a clan pilot, is almost five times the price in battle value and 25 times the price in sea bills. It's not hard to imagine an instance where a Timberwolf leading a star of Clan Max might be, when fighting a comparably equipped vehicle formation, assaulted by dozens, or perhaps even a hundred vehicles of various types and roles. Each vehicle as well is armed and equipped with dangerous weapon systems that themselves might be able to narrow in on vulnerable spots on these mechs, or in the case of vehicles like the Saladin, can blast holes straight through them. And this only describes vehicles in a direct combat role. Vehicles such as LRM carriers are a true nightmare, especially if they are kept out of the most direct level of fighting, delivering volleys of rockets in support of friendly units. A step above that are vehicles like Arrow 4 carriers, thumpers, or long-tom artillery vehicles, which can deliver traumatizing levels of ordnance on targets from beyond the view of enemy mechs. So yes, vehicles are still a match for their mech counterparts, both in the lore and on the tabletop. But it is important to realize their limitations, as to use them most effectively. At the end of the day, Battletech is about battle mechs, before it is about armored fighting vehicles aerospace assets, or warships, and the rules do them favors as a result. But that does not mean that these dangerous, traditional weapons don't have a role to play, particularly ground vehicles. Many a mech warrior have been humiliated by what is perceived as the weapons of yesterday. Vertical takeoff and landing vehicles are another major branch of the vehicle family which appears normally on the tabletop, and appears frequently in video games, as well as the setting as a whole. These represent any form of vehicle which has these features, either traditional helicopters or other advanced forms of flying machines which results in similar behavior. VTOLs offer a unique asset on the field. Not only is their speed almost universally impressive, they also have the ability to go up and down in elevation on the battlefield, taking themselves to a higher altitude in order to get better attack vectors on their opponents, or descending in order to reduce their profile. Their primary shield for defense is their movement, and their passive defensive buff from simply being a VTOL in motion. There are other reasons to elevate themselves or not on the field, or to use just their immense speed, but these are just some examples. These attack craft are extremely dangerous to any on-field asset, especially with their wildly variable weapon systems. They carry weapons ranging from medium lasers to terrifying gauss rifles. These weapons, however, are far from perfect in their own respect, and despite being potentially hard to hit, VTOLs are notoriously easy to down once they take reliable fire from ground forces. Rotary blades alone can be extremely vulnerable to fire, and even the chassis can be shattered by strong enough weapon systems. Failing piloting skill checks as well can be catastrophic for VTOLs for very obvious reasons, such as crashing the VTOL and causing it to explode when it hits the ground. It is also noteworthy that VTOLs, again, 
have similar problems to other vehicles regarding critical hits as well. But despite their fragility, a combination of mobility and firepower can make these airborne devils more than dangerous to any ground-based force. They can stay at long ranges and harass in some configurations, or others will be built for swooping, close-range attacks, flying in like lancers charging into the flanks of a block formation. Much like their ground-based counterparts, these traditional vehicles are a nightmare to deal with when employed effectively. One thing that applies mostly to tracked vehicles is that there are an assortment of vehicles that have alternative roles than just being in direct combat. On-field command vehicles are particularly vital to campaigns, for instance. The Mobile HQ, as it's dubbed in most cases, is a 25-ton vehicle used by military command staff to coordinate campaigns, communicate with forces on world, relay information to other forces in orbit, and is vital for a multitude of reasons beyond just being directly in combat themselves. They cannot be undervalued in this sense. Another example would be the Swiftwind Scout Car, which is a fast operating scout designed to communicate with other forces and relay enemy positions. Faster than most recon mechs, but being wheeled and limited in terms of some of its deployment regions, this quick, relatively light vehicle is a choice for planets or units with a budget in mind. Other important roles vehicles take up are important for the logistics of warfare. Things like transport trucks or dedicated ordnance transports that keep both tanks and battle mechs supplied in their campaigns. Another asset not to be forgotten is engineering vehicles, which can be used to repair or replace downed bridges, or remove obstacles in the way of forces on the march. Amongst the most vital are MASH units, or Mobile Army Surgical Hospitals which keep infantry, tank crews, and mech warriors alive should they be found injured or in some form of physical distress. These are vital again for any real campaign on planet, and are used by most serious forces. So just to go over them, vehicles fulfill a series of roles that mechs can't do outside of direct combat roles as well, ranging from command to medical to transport. They are vital in almost every sense of the word. There are numerous examples of traditional vehicle forces being used to great effect in Battletech against mech forces, but I don't think there is any better example of their use than the defense of the Lyran Commonwealth in the 12th Battle of Hesphorus, at least on a large scale. Five regiments of the elite Wolstergoon's mercenary unit made an attack on this, the most fortified factory world in the Inner Sphere in an attempt to raid and ruin it on behalf of the Free Worlds League. The Lyran defenders, as well as their hired mercenaries, would upset the result, delivering the first defeat to the Wolstergoons in the Inner Sphere in a desperate but crushing victory over the mercenary unit, killing a full half of the unit and even a multitude of their officers. Interestingly, the biggest turning points in the battle had major elements played by vehicles rather than by battle mechs. Despite a successful landing, the Dragoons would find themselves needing to cross the kilometer-wide and very deep Irhuan River, and would do so in their battle mechs. Covered by artillery and aircraft, they would attempt to make the push through on June 22nd, 3019. Swarms of Lyran hovercraft, aerospace fighters, and other flying craft like VTOLs took to the river's surface as an enormous battle took place. These assets began dropping depth charges into the river, fragmenting and destroying Dragoon mechs, and turning them into water-filled caskets for the warriors within, in a horror-filled exchange. These craft on the surface, going along at high speeds, were not themselves impervious to incoming fire by any means as the Dragoons fired on them from the riverbank and unloaded artillery into the river painting a mural of destruction which could be seen from below by terrified mech warriors. The crossing was never completed, despite several attempts, with even the head of Epsilon Regiment being killed in action, Colonel Harold Jones, who died beneath the waves of the river. 
the grand confrontation with the Black Widow Company, as well as Delta and Epsilon regiments, who bypassed the thickest defenses to get into the enemy's rear, and to reach the manufacturing center of Hesphorus, would be counterattacked by Hansen's Rough Riders in a shock offensive that drove back the superior Dragoon attack. It would be the tank arm of the Rough Riders that would follow up this engagement, flanking the Dragoons and causing them to retreat through the mountains from which they had attacked. These tankers rode their vehicles to the limits in this vicious exchange, driving the demoralized enemy back and eventually locking them behind a defensive position for the remainder of the battle. Without them, it is unlikely that the mech forces of Hansen's Rough Riders would have been able to achieve this victory on their own. The tanks were the deciding factor in the bloody battle in these mountains. This is just the best example of a combined arms force that I could immediately think of regarding this. Vehicles are a great asset for shaping the battlefield, both narratively or in-game. They can be used in tactical ways that mechs simply can't, either because of their expendability or because of their unique features. Need backup on a budget? An LRM carrier is a great stand-in for an archer and a save on battle value or sea bills. Need to be ready to ambush mechs in a city? Hetzers or other gun platforms are far more economic than something like the urban mech, or even more competent designs like the Enforcer. There is just a plethora of options for either the mech commanders, namely the players, or for the governors and military staff in universe. Vehicles might not be viewed as the top of the mountain any longer, but make no mistake, they are still very dangerous assets, especially when deployed with care and with the right conditions in mind. The Industrial Age fundamentally changed life for humanity in almost every respect. It increased life expectancies. It removed or improved backbreaking labor and increased yields of products and quality dramatically. The quality of buildings, farming, and just about every staple of human activity was in some way enhanced. Eventually, this would lead to the train, automobile, aeroplane, and spaceflight. In the realm of warfare, it would change just as much. Though one may argue perhaps it has not helped the quality of people's lives in this respect with a grim, faceless machine destroying human lives on an industrial scale. Armored fighting vehicles, VTOLs, and other vehicles remained the masters of this realm, barring the daring of the average human infantryman, until in the world of Battletech, we saw the arrival of their great nemesis, the Battlemech, a kind of machine that would see their use rescind from the highest levels of service. Even then, these machines would not disappear as displayed in this video, but instead they would now live a second life, one in backwaters, militias, and other complementing elements to mech forces that now dominate the inner sphere and humanity's military tactics, strategies, and advanced industries. But to ignore them, or to assume they are little more than a speed bump for mech forces, such as they are depicted in HPS's Battletech, or as they are shown in MechWarrior 5, is to embrace a power fantasy of those who sit behind the armored interior of a MechWarrior's cockpit. The reality is much closer to what the clan MechWarriors of the Wolf's Dragoons experienced, where it was not enemy mech forces that fully stopped them. Brave men and women beneath the waves of the Erkwan River could only look up helplessly as fate decided whether the depth charges deployed by hovercraft, VTOL, and aerospace assets would doom them to an unthinkable, watery grave. And then later, even in their prime environment, it would be these same talented and veteran mech warriors who would find themselves at the mercy of rolling thunder, as the tanks of Hansen's Rough Riders shattered the last hopes for a breakthrough by their forces, and sent more of their share of warriors to their graves. These vehicles, Perhaps, were they embraced more fully in more situations, just might outfight their mech counterparts. History took the Battletech universe down another path. 
But the era of the tank, and its related designs, has not yet ended. That is a feat even battle mechs could not perform. Perhaps it is an era of their reduction. Or perhaps the last 500 years is just a lull before a revival takes place. And once more, the crown is returned to the king. Good work. And kid, don't think of them as people you killed. Just think of them as another line on your resume. Thank you for joining me here today. This video is the opening for several other videos which are planned to cover specific armored fighting vehicles. I will be focusing almost exclusively on vehicle video releases until the arrival of the Mercenaries Kickstarter. I will have a link in the description of this video to the backer kit for the upcoming official Kickstarter for Battletech in this regard, which goes live on March 23rd. To let you know some of the vehicle videos which are planned, there are the following. The Manticore. The Long Tom Artillery System. The Demolisher. The Warrior VTOL. The Patton, or Rommel. And the Pegasus Hover Tank. Others may be covered afterwards as well, but these are going to be the ones exclusively covered for the upcoming release. And I will be working on these only with the exception of perhaps an April 1st video until they are done. So, with that, if you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. I release content fairly regularly, and you'll be happy with that content, I think. Also, if you want to support this channel further, you can join as a YouTube channel member. When you hit the join button and become a member, you take an extra step in supporting the work I do here. And I can't thank you enough, as this channel really is only possible because of viewers like you. And with that, as per usual, I look forward to hearing from everyone in the comment section below.